All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. Uh, my name is Michael Benza. I am a senior lecturer of law at Case Western Reserve School of Law. I have been teaching there for uh, about 15 years now. I'm also in private practice. Uh, my primary area of my practice is representing people who are facing capital charges uh, all the way through uh, their executions, primarily focusing on federal habeas litigation uh, and things like that. This morning, what I'm going to talk about is the issues regarding the Eighth Amendment and the execution of the mentally ill. Um, but as we go through, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. We'll have some time at the end to, to ask questions as well, but it's always much more fun for me and I think much more fun for the audience if you actually uh, participate during uh, my discussion so that it's actually a discussion as opposed to a lecture. Uh, and I do see uh, several of my former students, so I will be calling on them throughout uh, to test whether or not they remember anything from my classes. No, okay. Um, so uh, you, how many of you are lawyers? Before we get started, I just want to take a look. Okay, how many of you are thinking about becoming lawyers? No, okay, so, all right, so I want to take you back and, and you'll all break out into a cold sweat for a moment and then it, that will pass. Uh, this is gonna be a lot like a law school class. Uh, in order to understand, I think, the issue regarding the Eighth Amendment and the execution of the mentally ill, you have to have an understanding, an idea of how it is that the court has started to develop and is applying the issues of the Eighth Amendment to all of capital punishment. And so I'm gonna give you a sort of a legal history lesson of how the court has developed our laws surrounding capital punishment and then where that takes us when it comes to executing the mentally ill. And of course, the first case to start with is the Furman case from 1972 in which the Supreme Court banned executions uh, across the country. And really, if you look back at that, the main idea behind the Furman case was that the application of the death penalty in an individual case seemed to be completely random. Uh, the main undertone of the Furman case, of course, is Furman versus Georgia. It was two, uh, three black men uh, came before the Supreme Court with three different cases. Uh, one had committed a homicide, two had committed rapes against white women, and all three had been sentenced to death. The undertone of that case and the real social policy that was driving that case was the issue regarding race. But amazingly enough, throughout the entire opinion, only one justice even talked about the questions regarding race. That was Justice Douglas. None of the other justices acknowledged the questions really regarding race. And instead, what the court focused on was the randomness of the application of capital punishment, that there didn't seem to be any rhyme nor reason for who got death and, and who didn't. And so the Supreme Court throws out capital punishment across the country, analogizing the application of the death penalty to being struck by lightning, and outlines for the states that capital punishment can't be applied in this particular way. Now what we know historically after Furman was that the vast majority of the members of the court, including those that were in the, the dissent, believed that capital punishment was over in the United States that their decision would have prevented capital punishment from ever being re-implemented across the country. And of course, we know that's not true. Immediately after Furman, the states got together uh, and started drafting new death penalty statutes to try and comply with the outline of, of the Furman decision. The next set of cases that comes before the court are these new cases with new death penalty decisions uh, or death penalty statutes across the country. And the primary one is Gregg versus Georgia. And in Greg, what the court started to do was outline the procedural mechanisms that are going to be necessary to keep capital punishment constitutional. That if we have enough procedural rules guiding how death penalty cases are done, then the application of the penalty would be proper. It would not be random. There would be, and in fact, at one point, the court says in the opinion, we will be able to tell the difference between a death case and a life case. And you see emerging from this line of cases the idea that only special types of cases are going to be eligible for the death penalty, right? And you see the development of these aggravating circumstances, that there must be something special about the murder that happens that drives this case to be a death penalty case. That a simple murder isn't enough. And that if we control and guide those cases for which the death penalty is eligible, that will give us an understanding again as to why that particular case is in fact a death penalty case. So this is where our concept of aggravating circumstances comes leading into this particular thing. The next issue that comes up is the same case or the same set of cases. The court has about four different death penalty cases up in front of them in 1976 is Woodson versus North Carolina. Uh, 
Now, North Carolina took an interesting way of addressing this arbitrariness or randomness of capital punishment. Their mechanism was to make a mandatory death penalty. That anybody who was convicted of what they defined as capital murder must be sentenced to death, which eliminates all randomness, right? If everybody gets a death, you can't argue that it was random because you committed this crime, that crime's a death case, everybody gets death. And yet the U.S. Supreme Court said that's not the appropriate way of fixing the problem of randomness. And you start to see the court messing around into this second area that is in part driving our capital jurisprudence. So it's one is specifically guiding the crime, keeping the crimes narrowed. And the other is to control who gets the death penalty. And the problem that the court identified in the Woodson case was that a mandatory death penalty scheme does not recognize the fact that somebody who does something very bad may not be somebody for whom the death penalty is appropriate. And so recognizing that individual characteristics of the defendant have to be taken into account in order to decide between life or death. We could take a survey here and we could prove this idea. I want you all to imagine the worst crime you can possibly think of. All right, so you all have a picture in your mind, this, this worst crime, but whatever your views about capital punishment are, this particular person has committed this particular type of crime, I can see the death penalty being here. All right, we can always start with the easier one. Um, I always have to adjust it for the timing depending on what's going on. But the easy one is, uh, you know, somebody like Adolf Hitler. Right, you can think about somebody like that and say, well, if we're going to have a death penalty, somebody like that is who the death penalty would be appropriate for. You recognize that aspect, and then you have to stay, you know, say, okay, we've got this set of crimes for which we recognize the death penalty is appropriate, but we recognize then that there are certain criminals who commit that type of crime for whom the death penalty is not appropriate. So now I want you to take your crime and imagine a person who has committed that crime and imagine those characteristics that you would say, yeah, but that's not the person for whom an execution would be appropriate. And as soon as you start to identify that, you've now identified those two sort of conflicting policies that the court is trying to balance, it is recognizing that certain crimes are eligible for the death penalty, but that certain individuals may not deserve to die. And so you see that in these early cases, balancing these two things. The next set of cases that comes along reinforces this idea of individual sentencing considerations. And this is the Lockett versus Ohio case um, and the Eddings versus Oklahoma. This understanding that juries have to be given information about the defendant in order to decide whether or not the defendant is in fact somebody for whom execution is the appropriate penalty. We found that they have in fact committed the special type of crime that's necessary for eligibility for the death sentence, but maybe this particular defendant isn't the type of person for whom the death penalty might be appropriate. And so Lockett versus Ohio starts to develop this concept of mitigating factors. This creates what the court is now recognizing, this fact that we want to have guidance for the application of the death penalty. That is limiting the scope of the application, narrowing the definition of the crimes, keeping this to a very small set of people who are eligible for the death penalty while also recognizing a broad sense of liberty of the justice or the judge or the jury who are doing the sentencing to impose a life sentence because this defendant isn't the person for whom execution is appropriate. Most of the focus during this early time, this first 10 or 15 years of the litigation, was on individuals. Is this individual the person for whom death penalty is appropriate? Is this type of crime in this particular case the type of crime for which the death penalty is appropriate? Once the court started to focus and develop that area, they then moved into group issues. And that is identifying particular types of groups for whom death penalty is or isn't appropriate. One of the early areas that it developed was what type of crime is going to be appropriate for the death penalty. And the law that emerges from that is that the only type of crime for which the death penalty can be opposed is a homicide. Non-fatal crimes, no matter how bad they are, are not something for which the death penalty can be appropriate. And so you've got now a whole class exclusion of all the criminals that exist. The only criminals that will be eligible for the death penalty are those that kill. 
But we know that even within that set of people who kill, that there will be a set of those for which the death penalty is also not an appropriate punishment. And so the next set of people that the court starts to address is what about culpability involved in a homicide case? So the first case is the Edmund case out, coming out of Florida. Edmund is the accomplice in a home invasion that goes very bad. Two people end up being killed. Edmund is, at best, described as the driver of the getaway car. Um, he's actually sleeping in the back seat of the car, according to the evidence that implicates him, sleeping in the back seat of the car when these other two people go in and do the invasion. They kill the people. They come out. They drive away. And the court finds that in, even though, as a matter of criminal law, accomplice liability makes Edmund guilty of the homicides, the robberies, the other things that happen because of accomplice liability, he is, however, not eligible for the death penalty. That an accomplice to a death penalty offense cannot be executed and isn't even eligible for the death penalty, guiding by this parameters that somebody who doesn't want to kill, doesn't intend that anybody dies, doesn't actually cause a death, isn't somebody for whom the death penalty is appropriate. So we have this per se exclusion of accomplices even in capital murder cases. Until a few years later, along come a set of accomplices who are much more culpable in the underlying murders. And the court backtracks a little bit from that and says, well, we have a group exclusion for accomplices. But we only exclude those accomplices who are actually sort of innocent of the underlying homicide. If, in fact, your accomplice liability for the crime is sufficient to make you a bad enough person, then we're going to bring you back into the death penalty as a possibility. And you see what the court is trying to do with these particular diversions of accomplice liability. That is that there is a particular type of accomplice that is never going to be appropriate for the death penalty, but that there are, in fact, some accomplices who we think the death penalty may be appropriate. And this sort of becomes the guiding theory of the court when it comes to these group exclusion type of cases. Is there a group that we can identify? Once we identify that group, so let's start with our case right now, we have the accomplices. Are there going to be accomplices for whom the death penalty may be appropriate? If you answer yes to that question, then you see that the, the result from the court's analysis is that we don't exclude the entire group and instead exclude the group individually depending on personal characteristics, other issues. On the other hand, if you look at this group and you say nobody in this group should ever be subjected to capital punishment, then the court excludes the entire group. So for accomplices, the court recognizes that there will be a certain level of accomplice liability for which the death penalty may be appropriate. That is that there are accomplices out there who are guilty enough of the crimes, who are heavily involved, maybe they didn't do the actual killing, but they're the mastermind behind it, all right, or other types of aspects of this that allows the court to say they, in fact, may be eligible for the death penalty. So that's this guiding theory, and we see that as the court goes through with these ideas for group exclusions. So why does the court, for example, exclude non-homicide cases? Well, the main reason behind that is no matter how bad the crime is that you have committed, as long as it is a non-fatal crime, the victim is still alive. Whatever other damage you may have done to the victim in that case, the victim is still alive. And so the court has decided that under our evolving standards of decency, that in and of itself is the difference between the group of people eligible for the death penalty and not. No matter how bad your crime, if nobody dies, it's not going to be a death penalty offense. Um, it's a very interesting opinion. If you want to see political correctness at its worst, uh, coming from the U.S. Supreme Court, you can read the Coker opinion. Justice Kennedy, it's a, a non-fatal rape case with a person who is as unsympathetic as you can possibly imagine. The defendant, Mr. Coker, uh, escapes from prison where he's doing life terms for rapes and murders, escapes from prison, and the first thing he does is break into a little old lady's house where uh, he severely beats her and rapes her, leaves her for dead. She doesn't die and then he eventually gets recaptured. If you're thinking about a non-fatal crime for whom the defendant is probably somebody who would think about execution being appropriate, Mr. Coker is probably it. And yet Justice Kennedy goes through very difficult analysis in terms of the political correctness of saying why rape is not as bad as homicide. 
Um, and he's, you know, yes, rape is a terrible crime and it does all this damage, but at the end of the day, the victim of a rape is still alive, whereas the victim of a homicide is not. And that difference is what drives the court in making this group exception. All right? So we're going to keep that idea in mind as we go through this next set of cases because what the court does in the accomplice liability cases is decide that some groups of people can, in fact, be executed based on what it is that they've done. We've not opted out an entire group, depending on the particularities of the accomplice liability and the homicides. But the next line of cases really does present what we're going after uh, this morning with our discussions, and that is what about groups of people for whom the death penalty will be an option? The crime that they have committed is, in fact, a death penalty offense. Are there types of people for whom we as a society just don't think execution is appropriate. And the court starts to delve into this very early on, relatively speaking, in capital punishment litigation. 1988, they take up a case coming out of Oklahoma, and the question is, does the Eighth Amendment prohibit the execution of people who are 15 at the time that they commit a capital murder? Um, this was the only state that allowed this uh, directly to execute 15-year-olds. And the Supreme Court decides that no, in fact, the Eighth Amendment, our evolving standards of decency, decide that 15-year-olds are not the type of people for whom the death penalty is ever going to be appropriate. That no 15-year-old, no matter what it is that they've done, should ever be eligible for capital punishment. So this is the first real group where the court identifies a person and says this group can never be sentenced to death in spite of the fact that what they've done is, in fact, a death penalty offense. The very next year, Thompson's not even, the printing on the, on the mimeograph isn't even dry yet before the Supreme Court takes up another set of cases for the 1989 term, and they take up two. They take up Stanford versus Kentucky and Penry versus Linnow. And I first want to talk about Stanford because Stanford is the follow-up case to Thompson. Thompson decided we can't execute people 15 and under at the time of their offense. Stanford presents the issue, what about 16 and 17 year olds, people under the age of 18? Uh, the Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, as most of the decisions in the early days of capital litigation were five to four decisions, five to four make the decision that in fact, 16 and 17 year olds are eligible for capital punishment. And the reason for that is the same underlying rationale that goes along with the group exclusions or the, fit, the lack of group exclusion for accomplice liability. That there are, in fact, going to be 16 and 17 year old capital defendants for whom the death penalty may, in fact, be the appropriate sentence. And because they reach that decision, they don't make the exception for 16 and 17 year olds. The very same day they decide the Penry versus Linnow case, Penry was the question whether or not we exempt people with mental retardation from capital punishment. And again, the Supreme Court goes through the same type of analysis of looking at whether or not there may be some person with mental retardation for whom the death penalty may be an appropriate penalty. And because they can identify particular defendants, in particular in John Paul Penry's case, John Paul, uh, the crimes that he were convicted of were, were very terrible. And they said that, in fact, may be something for which the death penalty would be appropriate. And so they don't exclude that group of age, juveniles, 16 and 17 year olds are still eligible for capital punishment and people with mental retardation are eligible for capital punishment. Relatively speaking for the Supreme Court, in a very short period of time, these cases come back. 2002, the Supreme Court takes up the Atkins case and revisits the question regarding mental retardation the court reverses itself, which it doesn't do very often in such a short period of time. Those of you who follow the Supreme Court know that they don't like to reverse themselves uh, very often, but they do, in fact, revisit the issue of mental retardation and come to the opposite conclusion. But you see now an evolution of where the court is thinking and how they're going to do the analysis. And the next two cases, I think, are going to be our jumping off point for how we figure out what is the future for people with mental illness on death row. The first thing that you notice when the court starts talking about whether or not people with mental retardation should be eligible for capital punishment is a focus by the court on what is the condition of mental retardation. 
what is it like to be a person with mental retardation, especially a person with mental retardation in the criminal justice system? How are these people different than other people, regular people, non-MR people, in the criminal justice system? And you see the court identifying a number of very specific factors. First off, they identify that people with mental retardation tend to be less culpable for their conduct. They may still be criminally liable. Remember, we're not talking about people who are incompetent or not guilty by reason of insanity or some other exception. These are people who can be tried, can be found guilty. The question is, are they eligible for the death penalty? And the court identifies that for the most part, people with mental retardation are less culpable because of their conduct, because of their mental retardation. We don't hold them as responsible. They tend to be followers, not leaders, that when it comes to committing crimes, they tend to follow along with other people who are leading them into it. One of the characteristic uh, traits of mental retardation is that there is a lack of premeditation. The, the people can't plan ahead as we expect and, and want when it comes to capital uh, culpability, that they don't plan ahead as much. They're much more impulsive when it comes to exercising control over situations instead of it. Uh, exercising impulse control, they, they tend to not. The court also looked at real concerns about the impact of mental retardation on the fairness of the criminal proceedings. If anybody is represented, anybody do, how many of you do criminal work? Um, how many of you do work with people with mental retardation, whether it's criminal work or civil work with people? All right. You know some of the challenges that come with representing people who are mentally retarded. There's a real effort that needs to be put into explaining the system, making sure that they understand, that they can give you the information that you need from them. Those types of things can come up with re representing people with mental retardation that you don't always have with people uh, of regular, uh, of normal IQ when it comes to representing them as clients. There's a real concern for the court regarding false confessions for people who have mental retardation. There is a real incentive among people who in Mental retardation, one of the, the characteristic, characteristic traits, is a willingness to please the authorities. Um, we see a lot of our false confession cases with clients who are of low intelligence because they want to make the police happy. Uh, and so they end up in these situations where they give full confessions uh, to having committed the crime. And in fact, it turns out to be a false confession because they're just simply trying to, to please the police. And then there's also the real concern that there is, in fact, a diminished capacity, that these people may be competent to go through the criminal justice system, but there's a real diminished capacity for them to really be engaged uh, in the process itself. Once the court identifies these characteristics, you see them looking at that and saying, that group of characteristics leads us to the understanding that, in fact, there just isn't somebody in that group of people for whom the death penalty is going to be appropriate. These factors don't sway us that no matter how bad the crime is, that somebody who has this problem is really somebody for whom we are going to think execution is appropriate. Coupled that with these two prime focuses, and I want you all to remember back to your first year criminal law class. Uh, if you, some of you had me for criminal law, uh, and you know that the first thing you do in criminal law is you learn the theories of punishment. Why is it that we punish? Well, in capital punishment, we're only focused on two. There are only two theories of punishment that support and justify capital punishment. The first is deterrence, that, that we accept as a maxim that capital punishment, in fact, deters future crimes. And we're, all, we're talking about, in this particular case, with deterrence, as you, you can remember, there's general and specific. Specific is that this defendant will never commit another crime. Well, of course, we know that's a truism in capital punishment because we execute them. They will never commit another crime. But that's not our focus. The focus is on general deterrence. Will the application of capital punishment prevent other people from committing capital murders? And the other aspect of social value of, of theories of punishment that support capital punishment is retribution, that there is some just deserts due to this defendant for this crime that justifies uh, carrying out the execution. And the court looks at this, this group characteristics, applies those characteristics to those two theories, and say, well, clearly deterrence doesn't work. Um, one of the stereotypical aspects of mental retardation is that there is a failure to learn from past negative outcomes or from past positive outcomes. Um, people with mental retardation have a very difficult time translating abstractly 
good outcomes from good behavior to continue to do good behavior or bad outcomes from behavior to stop doing um, bad outcomes. And so there's no deterrent value. You're not going to deter other people from me with mental retardation if you execute other people with mental retardation. The other part of that, of course, is that if we don't execute people with mental retardation, we'll not have any impact on the deterrent effect for non-mentally retarded people. Because if, in fact, there is a deterrent value, people who are not mentally retarded will know that because they're not mentally retarded, they're not going to be saved from capital punishment, and therefore they will not uh, engage in, in criminal behavior. And then finally, the issue with retribution. The issue for retribution, I think, is most easily seen with mental retardation um, for this. And I always tell my students in, in my death penalty class, this is where I get de deeply disenfranchised with our public education system. So let's see if it fares a little better with a, a different population. How many of you have read of Mice and Men? All my students should be raising their hands. Good. All right. So how many of you, uh, let's see, those of you who weren't my students read of Mice and Men? All right. How many of you, if you haven't read the book, have seen either of the two very fine movies? There's the Burgess Meredith movie uh, and then the John Malkovich movie. Any of you seen those? All right. Or any of the made-for-TV versions? No? This is the one that always gets everybody. How many of you who have not read the book or seen the movies have ever watched Bugs Bunny? And the Bugs Bunny that I'm talking about is Bugs Bunny with the big yellow dog-looking thing. Not the orange monster, but the, the yellow dog thing. And he always grabs Bugs, and he squeezes them, and he pets them, and Bugs is my friend. I will love him, and, sque and he's squeezing the life out of Bugs. How many of you have seen that? See, this is the generation. I haven't seen Bugs Bunny. I don't know what you're talking about. All right. That's Lenny. All right. This, this, the Lenny character in Of Mice and Men, the yellow dog character in Bugs Bunny, is Lenny. Lenny is a person with mental retardation. Lenny commits what is, by definition, in the state of California at that time, a capital offense. One of the things I always tell my students is, look, read Of Mice and Men and stop reading that book just before George walks Lenny down to the riverbank. And ask yourself this. If Lenny is, in fact, arrested and tried and convicted, is Lenny the type of person for whom the death penalty is appropriate? So all of those of you who know Lenny, you've read the book, seen the movie, watched Bugs Bunny, I want you to assume whatever your beliefs about capital punishment are that you are in favor of capital punishment, except that, in fact, Lenny's crime is a capital offense. He committed an attempted rape and killed somebody. That is, even today, in most jurisdictions, a capital offense. How many of you think Lenny should be eligible for the death penalty? I never get anybody to raise their hand. Why is Lenny not somebody who the death penalty is appropriate for? And again, you have to, whatever your political and social views are on capital punishment, accept that it is the law. You're all sworn to follow the law. Your lawyers, you must apply the law faithfully. Why is Lenny not somebody for whom the death penalty is appropriate? Mike? OK. His diminishment, we, what we know about mental retardation and what we know about Lenny's life with mental retardation is that it's not appropriate. Is Lenny going to kill again, though? He probably, he probably could. What does Lenny do throughout? What's the opening scene of the book? He kills rabbits, right? He's always he's catching field mice. He's catching rabbits. That's his dream, right? He and George are going to be, save enough money. They're going to buy a little farm. He's going to raise rabbits. And yet, every time he gets a mouse or a rabbit, he kills it. Does he kill it to be malicious? No, he just doesn't make the connection between squeezing them too hard and their death. And he never will. He'll never make that connection. And so if Lenny finds himself in a similar situation that resulted in the death uh, in, of mice and men, he would end up killing again, which is sort of the perfect argument for why we should have capital punishment. And yet, and then this is the highly technical term that will come back around as we continue the discussion this morning, it's icky to kill Lenny. And that really is what's underlying the court's Eighth Amendment analysis when it comes to these group exclusions. Is it icky to kill somebody like this? Now, Lenny has the greatest mitigation case you would ever want. You spend 150 pages of this very short novella getting to know Lenny, liking Lenny, 
understanding why Lenny does what he does, nobody is ever going to kill Lenny. But can you imagine a person with mental retardation for whom the death penalty would be appropriate? Now that we've talked about Lenny for about three or four minutes, none of you can imagine a person with mental retardation without imagining Lenny. And that's what's driving the court. And so the court comes back around and says, no, our understanding about mental retardation today leads us to the decision that no person, no matter how bad they are, no matter how bad the crime is that they've committed, should ever be eligible for the death penalty if they suffer from mental retardation. And what's really fascinating about this development with these group exclusions is that at no time does the court talk about a connection between their mental retardation and the crime. This is not, Lenny is not responsible because he committed the crime because he was mentally retarded. There is no causal connection. If you are, in fact, a person with mental retardation and you are facing capital charges, as soon as they make the finding that you are mentally retarded, you are no longer eligible for the death penalty without regard to whether or not the, capital pun the <laughs> mental retardation caused you to commit the crime. All right? So that's the first step in this group exclusions. We now exclude 15 years and older, and we exclude people with mental retardation. Three years later, in 2005, the court revisits the issue regarding juveniles. The case comes up to them in a very interesting procedural part, something law professors um, are about the only ones that really care about. Um, but procedurally, the case comes to them um, on a direct appeal. Uh, it comes up because the uh, Supreme Court in Missouri decided that they didn't like the Eighth Amendment rules dealing with juveniles. And so they wrote an opinion that says that whatever it is that the Supreme Court said in 1989 about executing juveniles is wrong. We think the Eighth Amendment prohibits all executions of anybody under the age of 18. Supreme Court, take that. Um, and threw down the gauntlet. Um, and said, go ahead, what are you going to do? Are you Are going to let us have our own constitution or are you going to take this case up? Um, and of course, the Supreme Court took it up. They couldn't ignore the sort of blatant uh, challenge from a state to, to their authority, so they take the case up. Um, and they get to this case and they're going to visit 16 and 7 year old, or 17 year olds. And again, the court starts its analysis with the conditions of juveniles. What is it like to be 16 or 17? especially 16 or 17 um, in the criminal justice system. Well, we've all been there. None of us want to go back. Everybody can go back in time. Most people would like to go back to their mid-20s. Nobody wants to go back to being 16, right? How many want to go back to, you know, I have my daughter is 14, and she's like, I know everything. And I'm like, oh, yeah, OK. When you get to be 30, ask yourself, do you really want to go back to be a middle school kid, you know, a freshman in high school? Is that where you want to go? How many of you want to go back to being 16 or 17? Nobody, 16, yeah, I'll do it. How many of you would prefer to go back to be 27, 28, you know, a little bit more? There you go. That's what we want to do. All right. Well, what is it to be 16 or 17 that, that leads to these issues? Well, of course, the big thing is that juveniles are less mature than adults, right? You know, they have less impulse control. They're less culpable. Um, there is a very particular reason why we have a separate juvenile justice system from the adult criminal justice system. The juveniles are adjudicated delinquent. They are not found guilty of crimes. Right? They, we recognize that kids are just different. Um, there is a greater capacity for growth among juveniles. Um, underlying that was the idea for the court that we simply don't write kids off. And yet, if you impose capital punishment on a teenager, you've written that kid off that there is nothing that this juvenile can do for whatever the rest of his life, the next 15 or 20 years that he'll live on death row, nothing that he could do that would show that he is, in fact, a better person than the crime that he has committed. And we don't write kids off uh, in that particular way. And then also underlying that was a recognition from the court that society owes a special obligation to kids that we as a society take responsibility for kids until magically your 18th birthday, then they kick you out of the house and you're on your own. But when you're under the age of 18, society owes you certain things, some duties of care, support, things like that. And so these special conditions, again, raise concerns for the courts about the validity of juveniles going through the criminal justice system. 
And then they move into the next aspect. Do the social policies behind capital punishment justify executing juveniles? So first thing is for deterrence. Um, I want you all to think back to when you were 16 and 17 years old. Did anybody you know do something wrong, get caught, get punished, and you immediately went and did the same thing? Anybody who doesn't raise their hand is lying, right? Bad outcomes for other people never stop juveniles from doing bad things, right? Because I'm not going to get caught. I'm better than they are. They were stupid. It's not going to happen to me. Whatever their philosophy is, juveniles don't think that way. All right? The idea behind deterrence theory is that there is this cold cost-benefit analysis. Judge Posner loves the deterrent theory because it fits right within his model of the world that there is this cold calculation of cost and benefit. If we make the cost of doing the crime high enough so that the benefit is small, nobody will commit the crimes. Well, juveniles can't do the cost-benefit analysis of what to have for lunch versus whether or not they should commit a, a homicide or a robbery or whatever it is that leads to them facing criminal charges. They don't engage in that type of behavior. How many of you were amazed that you made it to be 21? You think back of what you did, right? I mean, those of you who have younger kids, think back to when you were riding in the car when my parents and I were, were, went to Florida for a family vacation. I rode at a, a 72 Montego, and I rode on the ledge of the back window the whole way down because my two brothers, one was in the floor, one was on the bench, and I was up in the window. Now the kids, it takes a half an hour to buckle them into the safety harnesses and all these other kinds of things. Amazing that we ever lived. You think about the things that you did as a teenager, you're going, wow. <laughs> it's amazing that half my class didn't die from the things that we did. Because we're kids, we do those things. Well, that's the same understanding then when it comes to deterrence, it's not going to apply to juveniles. Then the same thing becomes with the question of retribution. How many of you think that there is something icky about taking a 16-year-old kid, strapping him to a gurney, and filling him full of poison? Because that's what we do. How many of you think that's icky? Then it violates the Eighth Amendment. What is our social benefit for doing something like that? Does this 16-year-old kid really deserve that kind of punishment? And the court looks at it and says, no, as a class, this group doesn't deserve to die. That it is, in fact, icky to do this. So how does the court sort of justify this as lawyers about how we're doing? Well, they're going to look at a number of different factors. And we're going to take these factors and we're going to apply it to the question of mental illness. One is that they look at the history of capital punishment and this group of people. Historically, in the United States and at common law, meaning England, were these type of people eligible for executions? What is the current status of the law? Remember that the test for this is the evolving standards of decency. Does this violate what we think is right or wrong as a society? So what is the current legal status? That is, what are legislators around the country doing with this particular issue? Are they allowing it or are they not? What do juries and what do prosecutors do with this group of people? Do juries and prosecutors recognize that there's something icky about executing this group of people, that even when they come with these cases in front of judges or in front of juries, that they're not getting death sentences? Or that prosecutors are not bringing charges eligible for the death penalty against this particular group of people? What do judges do? And more and more recently, what do governors do when it comes to clemency? regarding this group of people? Do they recognize that these people are different? What do experts say who are familiar with this group of people? One of the biggest factors, I think, that was driving the Atkins decision was the involvement of organizations like the, the AAMR, the American Association for People with Mental Retardation. The AAMR wrote an amicus brief that outlined almost verbatim what the court found was like to live with mental retardation. They explained to the court why their client population were different than other people so that they shouldn't be executed. Um, we look at things like the American Psychological Association, the American Bar Association, these expert groups that have involvement and specialized knowledge about these group of people. Dirty little secret is the Supreme Court occasionally will look at international law. They tend to put it in footnotes because it leads to impeachment theories. But they do want to know about what does the rest of the world think about executing this group of people. 
And as you see the development from the mid 80s with Thompson and Stanford and Penry until Atkins and Roper in the 2000s was an evolution of all of those factors towards abolition of the death penalty for these groups of people. When John Paul Penry was in front of the Supreme Court, no state prohibited the execution of people with mental retardation. By the time the Atkins case gets to the Supreme Court in 2002, 18 states plus the federal government specifically said you cannot execute people with mental retardation. Now that's not an overwhelming shift in terms of exclusion. There's still a lot of states that theoretically and actually allowed the execution of people with mental retardation. But if you imagine how difficult it is to get pro-defendant, anti-death penalty legislation through the states, it's pretty amazing that you had 19 different, organ, different states or the federal government draft and adopt legislation saying this group of people cannot be executed. All right? So that was a very big factor. The same thing for the judges and prosecutors um, and juries. What are they doing with this group of people? So now the main issue. What do we do about people with mental illness? Everybody who's involved in capital litigation or involved in abolition activities or retention activities regarding capital punishment knows that this is the next big group. That this is the group that the Supreme Court is next going to have to address in terms of group exclusion. What do we do with people who are mentally ill? One of the problems that we face with this is that nobody knows the extent of the issue. Um, the only estimate that I've seen that has sort of any type of reliability is that somewhere between 5 and 10% of death row inmates satisfy this criteria for severely mentally ill. Um, I actually think it's probably higher than that. I've been doing death penalty litigation for 20 years. Um, at one point, Ohio had a special death row just for the mentally ill defendants, and there were almost 40 people um, being housed at that specialized unit for people with mental illness. Um, so that's more than 10% because right now we have under 200 people on, on Ohio's death row. Um, what do we do with these people? Well, if we look at our factors in the history of the United States, um, we execute the mentally ill all the time. Um, we, I've had several clients in the last uh, two years executed. Um, all but one of them had significant mental health problems. Um, we do this all the time. Uh, not a bar. Historically, we executed the mentally ill. Um, we continue to execute the mentally ill today. We do bar the execution of people who are incompetent. Um, that is, that their mental illness is so severe that they don't understand that they're being executed. But that's a very small subset of people. The people we're talking about are people with severe mental illnesses, the schizophrenics, the bipolar, schizoid type, these high-level axis one type of people Lots of them are on death row. Schizophrenic, uh, schizophrenia is a very common diagnosis among death row inmates. We execute them all the time. In terms of current legal status, right now only one state bars the execution of people with severe mental illness, and that's Connecticut. Um, if you follow capital litigation, Connecticut has one person on death row. <laughs> So they don't use the death penalty very often in Connecticut, um, but they're the only state right now that legislatively bans the execution of people with severe mental illness. Indiana is close. I gave you in, in the materials that you have, you see the draft legislation for Indiana. Indiana will probably be the next state to legislatively ban the execution of the mentally ill. Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina have all had legislation come through their process. Uh, to ban the execution of those with severe mental illnesses, all of those uh, avenues failed and those legislations were not passed. So there isn't a huge movement uh, towards legislatively eliminating that issue. So that's not going to carry a lot of weight with the Supreme Court. Well, what about judges and juries? Um, we know that the anecdotally it carries a lot of weight with prosecutors. Um, we know, for example, um, if you remember back a, a few years ago, there was a, a man who was shooting at cars on 270 down in Columbus. He was getting up on the overpasses and was shooting at, at cars on the freeway. Uh, and eventually he um, shot somebody and killed them, was eventually captured and was charged with capital murder. Uh, the case in the first time it went to trial resulted in a mistrial at guilt innocence. And the prosecutors did what good lawyers do is they went and they talked to the jury about why they got hung, and they were hung on the issue of not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, the man was a paranoid schizophrenic, had gone off his medications, um, and that seemed to be the reason for uh, these particular crimes. 
The prosecutors in that case made the conscious decision to not seek the death penalty when they retried him. Uh, and their statements to the media about why they had changed their minds, it was a capital case when they first brought it up, why did they change their minds? They changed their minds because they recognized that no jury was going to sentence him to death once they found out about the depth of his mental illness. They may, in fact, still get the conviction, but they were never going to get a death sentence. And so they didn't want to race, waste the resources, the time, the energy of doing a capital case when they knew they weren't going to get a death sentence. All right? Anecdotally, we know that those types of things happen all the time. We had that happen here in Cuyahoga County, um, a factor that was working into the uh, plea agreement that was entered into for the gentleman who was um, who killed Cleveland Heights police officer during a traffic stop was the level of his mental illness uh, and the active uh, mental illness that he was under at the time that he committed the offense. Again, leading to avenues for plea bargains, taking death penalties off the table. For juries, the evidence is a little bit different. Um, the evidence seems to be all over the place. We know, for example, there is a real risk that juries will, in fact, use the defendant's mental illness as a reason to execute them. Um, that the fear of people with mental illness uh, is so strong that they actually use that as a reason to carry out executions. On the other hand, other jurors tell us that that is, in fact, the biggest issue that they have in front of them, that they don't carry out an execution with, on a defendant that is um, severely mentally ill. What's interesting about what juries do with it is this is exactly the same thing that the court was faced with in the John Paul Penry case. Um, in the Penry case, if you remember, the court said you can, in fact, execute people who are mentally retarded. The second part of that case, however, is this issue here, was that jurors were, in fact, using mental retardation as a reason to impose the death penalty. And so the court granted relief to John Paul Penry and said, no, you have to go back and have a new sentencing proceeding so that the jury is specifically told that your mental retardation should be used as a reason to not kill you. Um, and that's what we're seeing now with mental illness, is that some jurors are in fact using mental illness as a reason to carry out an execution as opposed to a reason not to execute. So it's very similar lining up with how the court was looking at it um, when they did the first issue with mental retardation. Again, the question regarding judges and governors, um, we know for, um, based on, again, it's sort of studies and anecdotal that lots of governors are focusing on issues regarding mental retardation or mental illness when it comes to granting clemency. Um, and judges are coming forward and either not imposing death when they have the option to not impose death because of issues of mental illness, or in cases in which they were the trial judge presiding over the case and imposed the death sentence as issues regarding mental illness get developed that weren't presented at the trial are coming forward uh, either in litigation or a clemency saying, if I had known this information at the time of the trial, I never would have given death. So we know that it's a very powerful factor for not giving death for these individuals. Uh, in terms of the experts, NAMI, the National Alliance for Mentally Ill, the American Bar Association, the American Psychological Association, whose white paper that you have there, all endorse the idea of not executing people with severe mental illness, um, which leads us to the idea that there seems to be a growing, evolving standards of decency regarding the execution of, of the mentally ill. When we factor in then our two social policies, retribution and deterrence, the same concepts seem to be at work. If you understand what it's like to be a person with severe mental illness, you understand then maybe why questions regarding deterrence and retribution don't seem to fit for them. Um, again, remember, we're not talking about people who are incompetent. We're not talking about people who are not guilty by reason of insanity. But these are people who have committed a capital offense, are liable for their capital crime, but suffer under some level of mental illness so that we have questions about the validity of the death penalty. Well, does deterrence work for somebody like that? All right, if you imagine that you, uh, if you have a client who's a paranoid schizophrenic, you imagine, again, that cost-benefit analysis that has to be engaged in in order for deterrence theory to work, paranoid schizophrenics are oftentimes skewed in how they make those cost-benefit analysis. They may, in fact, make the cost-benefit, but because of the delusions, the psychosis, the other aspects of mental illness, make a cost-benefit analysis that isn't a rational or logical evaluation. Um, the other part is that people, in terms of retribution, have the same kinds of diminished capacities uh, and diminished culpabilities that mental retardation uh, people or juveniles would have, making the concepts of retribution not as effective. 
And then when it comes to those other conditions, we have our same concerns with people with mental illness in the criminal justice system. Um, one is the issues regarding false confessions. People who are mentally ill make lots of confessions to things that just didn't happen. Um, there's a big issue of impulsivity with mental illnesses, suggestibility, that they engage in behaviors that are negative behaviors, criminal behaviors, because of issues regarding suggestibility from other people, delusional thinking. That leads to them, and again, not necessarily making them incompetent, but that their understanding of the world is different than ours. Sort of the, the thumbnail definition of mental illness is that their perception of reality is different than ours. Um, there's a lack of premeditation uh, with people with mental illness in, in many ways. And then really a big factor for the court, I think, is going to come to what is it like to be mentally ill in the courtroom. Um, if you've ever represented a mentally ill client um, in any type of proceeding, it's very difficult. Um, one of the things that you will hear from jurors um, is that the defendant presented himself or herself as very cold, disconnected from the, the proceedings, laughed inappropriately, any of these sort of... Uh, indications that if it was a normal person you would you know, take as a sociopath, you know, as a cold killer type of thing, that oftentimes is an impact one of the mental illness, sometimes it's an impact of the medication, those other types of things. So where does this take us? Well, it takes us to lots of litigation. Um, Justice Stratton, recently retired from the Ohio Supreme Court, um, several times in the last few years has called on the General Assembly to pass legislation to eliminate the death penalty for those who are severe mental illness. Um, nothing is happening in the Ohio General Assembly regarding that, but lots of General Assemblies are taking up this particular issue. One concept in, in question that is hanging around is how do we define mental illness? Uh, if anybody has ever picked up the DSM-4 and leafed through it, everybody in the world has a diagnosable mental illness. Um, we're not talking about, you know, histrionics, we're not talking about alcoholism. Uh, the real issues that you're talking about are those biggies, those axis one severe thought disorders, schizophrenia, schizotypal, bipolar, severe depression, um, things like that. So there, there's a definitional issue that's going to have to be worked out. And then there's a timing question. Um, one of the areas you see in the draft legislation, both Connecticut's past statute, the Indiana statute, the American Psychological Association's white paper, the ABA, um, are focusing on at the time of the crime. Was the defendant under a severe mental illness at the time of the crime? Um, next issue, if we resolve it in that time, that it must be severe mental illness at the time, is going to come, what do you do with people who develop severe mental illnesses after the fact? Um, we have a lot of people who commit their crimes or capital murders at 18, 19, 20 years old. If you have any familiarity with schizophrenia, that's sort of the early onset time periods. That they may not manifest and be diagnosed as schizophrenic until they get into their 20s. Um, or 30s, depending on, on their health care provisions, what do you do with those types of people uh, who develop their symptomology or the diagnosis much later on? Um, and so where do we go is on for litigation. Um, there seems to be a very real movement. Um, there's a lot of debate going on, both scholastically, professionally, and then within the courts. Um, but I've, right now, no court has found that it is, in fact, cruel and unusual to execute with people with in mental illness as a group exclusion. Um, my guess is that as the courts evolve, we're going to see the initial cases coming up and losing um, until at some point they get to the same place. That we'll see the Stanford versus Kentucky and the Penry type of cases that there are people with mental illness for whom the death penalty is appropriate, and then eventually to the point where, no, we don't execute the people with mentally ill. All right, um, we have some time for questions. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, we have a microphone so that they can pick this up for the webcast. I have a question. Oh, wait for the, the mic for a second. Thank you. Um, good morning. I wanted to ask, is on. I wanted to ask um, a little bit not what your topic was, but going back to the initial conversation about randomness mm -hmm. and whether that analysis or any litigation can be done on the clemency aspect so that some of the a state can't be random in the application of clemency of, of the death penalty because of all the people that we have on death row that were after foreman, but, um, you know, so that how, how can we, my objective is to save them. How can we uh, get some articulated standard to protect them mm -hmm. from, from the death penalty? Um, well, it, it, the question regarding clemency, the fact of the matter is, um, I'm 
responsible for part for making this law um, was one of my cases. The U.S. Supreme Court has, in fact, decided that purely random clemency decisions are perfectly fine. Um, so long as the governor doesn't do it for blatantly unconstitutional reasons, like all the white guys get clemency, all the black guys die, um, or that they flip a coin. Um, quite frankly, when the Supreme Court, when Justice O'Connor wrote that part of the opinion, and I stopped reading, he said, please give me a coin flip. At least I got a 50-50 shot. Um, but no, the, the, when it comes to clemency, it's a matter of grace. And so long as the decision maker is not applying unconstitutional means, that is, race or, or some other sort of protected class issue, uh, completely free to do um, pretty much anything that they, they want to do when it comes to clemency. So it can, in fact, be completely random. Um, uh, one of the most notorious issues regarding clemency was a guy in, in Missouri who was spared simply because of the timing that the Pope uh, came to St. Louis about a week before his execution and in the middle of high mass. I, I'm not Catholic, so I don't know all the ins and outs, but the, uh, the Pope in the middle of high mass with the hat and the crook and everything comes down and goes up to Governor Callahan and says, I understand you've got an execution. It'd be a great personal favor if you didn't do it. And Callahan granted clemency, and he, when asked about it, the guy, you know, he said, how do you say no to the Pope? Um, completely random. I mean, that was sort of a matter of luck. Um, lots of my guys write letters to the Pope. Please come. I've got an execution. Come and visit. And, you know, so, Mark. How does originalist theory merge with ickiness? <laughs> so the question is, how does originalist theory uh, merge with ickiness? And the fact of the matter is that it really doesn't. Um, Justice Scalia's opinion in dealing with the issue um, of juvenile death penalty, he actually wrote the plurality opinion in the Stanford case, not joined by Justice O'Connor to make the fifth vote. He said, look, historically, we executed six-year-olds. Uh, so it's not a problem to execute 16 and 17-year-olds because you know, it wasn't un unheard of to execute little kids. Um, it, that's not a big issue. And the main reason for that is that the court has developed a different line of theories regarding this issue, and that is the evolving standards of decency, which unfetters it from the originalist intent. Um, the question really for the court when they're evaluating this question is, do we do it today? Is it icky by today's standards to carry out this type of execution, which allows them the freedom then to not worry so much about the history behind it? So, which drives Justice Scalia crazy. I mean, Justice Scalia writes repeatedly in these types of cases that he just doesn't buy the evolving standards of decency. Um, but he's only three or four votes. So right now we still have the evolving standards of decency as the test. One more? more one more. Or not. Do you see um, the severely meant up? Uh, do you see the dis severely mentally ill being a bright line test or being a kind of like the porn, you know, when you see it? Yeah, it, you know, it, it probably will try to be written by the court as a bright line test. Um, what we know from Atkins litigation, mental retardation litigation, is it's never a bright line test. Um, what is a person with mental retardation? What is a person with a severe mental illness? Um, you know, the sort of the joke is if you get five psychiatrists to evaluate a patient, you're gonna get 10 different diagnoses. Um, it, you know, how sick is sick enough? Uh, really, the, the rule might be bright line. We shall not execute people with severe mental illness, and the definition of severe mental illness is the top five axis one diagnosis. That might be a bright line rule. The problem that will come up then is the application. Um, you know, I know personally I've litigated Atkins cases for mentally retarded clients. I have clients who have been mentally retarded from age six. Every person that's ever evaluated to them, school psychologists, criminal justice people, everywhere the client was diagnosed as mentally retarded until, including at his capital trial, that mitigation, the issue was, is he mentally retarded? And everybody said, yes, he's mentally retarded, we're still gonna kill him, until he gets to his Atkins hearing. When the issue of mental, Ill, mental retardation is the only question and the judge says, oh no, he's better. Um, and you can't get better, right? If you're mentally retarded, you're never going to get better. And yet, this client was found to be mentally retarded. On the other hand, we have clients who get to be found to be mentally retarded in which the evidence is there, but it's not, certainly not nearly as strong uh, as that particular defendant. So we might end up with a bright line test. The application is always gonna be fuzzy. Um, and I think that's one of the problems that is leading to legislation problems. How do you define this? You know, it's easy to say, okay, paranoid schizophrenia, but what does that mean? 
Um, you know, how do you prove that? How do you litigate those types of things? You know, is it connected to the crime? There's lots of other these, these sort of systemic problems. All right? All right, well, thank you very much for your time and attention.